Hello and welcome to North 100, a Canadian Highlander podcast. I'm Serge. Joining me today, I have Wheeler. Ahoy, ahoy. Reminder that North 100 is brought to you by you with your support over the Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Welcome to part two of our Streets of New Capenna set review. Today, we're going to be covering gold cards in the bizarre distribution that is this set. We managed to cover everything else in the first episode, except for one card, which I think may have been an oversight. Wheeler, why don't you start us off? For the real meme lords out there, it may have been an intentional oversight, but let's let's just get this out of the way. Luxior Giada's Gift. It's a one mana legendary artifact that happens to be an equipment. It says equip creature gets plus one plus one for each counter on it. Equip permanent isn't a planeswalker and is a creature in addition to its other types. And equip planeswalker for one generic, equip to a creature for three generic. And that was all from memory surge. Really? Yeah, people are really excited to play this card with Devoted Druid. I feel like I've talked about this card with Devoted Druid quite a bit. <laughs> for those not familiar with the interaction, basically. You tap to put a minus one, minus one counter on it to add a man, to untap it rather. And then it gets plus one, plus one because of that counter. So it kind of cancels out. So you can make infinite green mana oh, using that. Oh, mm -hmm. I get it. So yeah. And it just oh. so happens to be a one mana artifact, meaning that you can find it with Urza Saga and it's an equipment. So if you're a green white deck, you could also find it with, I don't know, Enlightened Tutor which finds swift reconfiguration, which is the other kind of thing that combos with this, or Stoneforge. So that's appealing. And like, yeah, maybe throwing this on like a Garrick could kill someone or a Gideon. But like, I don't know. I'd rather just play <laughs> Skull Clamp. You'll probably, it's the kind of card where it's like, yes, it does go infinite, but it doesn't have that same kind of shine that like swift reconfiguration has or, you know, walking ballista has. It's just, this one's a bit easier to find. So, yeah. Eh, uh, what? <laughs> this is the least excited I've ever heard you about an infinite. Oh, that's not true. We found plenty of, like, derpy combos y in the past. Yeah, it's not like, I mean, I think I was pretty unimpressed by the infinites from Urza Lord High Artificer, but that was mostly just like, oh, so you're going to do it for me, huh? <laughs> Way to take all the work out of it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you have a big creature that has no evasion, and you're like, sure. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on. The first gold card we're going to talk about today is Avon Heartstabber. This is a two-mana, one-one bird assassin for a blue and a black. It has flying, and as long as there are five or more mana values amongst cards in your graveyard, it gets plus two, plus two, and has death touch. And when it dies, mill two cards and then draw a card. So if you have a graveyard full of stuff, it's a 3-3 three, three with death touch. This card's kind of cool. It's sort of a like, build your own. Oh, no. Oh, no. Wheeler, did you forget two? Are you making fun no, of me? No, no, I'm not making fun of you. I'm trying to let you do your own work here. You know, not. I'm not going to urge your way Strix. to the card. Yeah, beautiful there, Strix. There we go. <laughs> there there go. we go. <laughs> So I like this card less than Baleful Strix. Um, Baleful Strix draws a card when it enters the battlefield. It always has Death Touch, and it's an artifact, which synergizes a lot of other stuff. This card's kind of neat, but I think if you're playing a blue-black deck that's trying to put cards in your graveyard and do stuff, you're probably better off playing the Delve creatures, uh, which would actually anti-synergize with this. But you're doing the same thing in, mm -hmm. in both of those decks, and I think this is a less exciting way to do it. That being said, a Two mana flyer uh, creature carries a GTA pretty well and yeah. might, probably has a home in some of those decks. And the fact that it dies, fills your graveyard, does help synergize with those types of decks that want cards in your graveyard anyways. So I'm I'm willing to give this a shot, you know? I'm ambivalent. I'm 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 not saying I hate this card. I just I don't think it's a slam dunk. Yeah, it's going to be the worst two mana cantrip creature if you play it in something like um, Soltai that already gets access to Ice Fang Quotal and Walla Blossoms and all that jazz. If I'm playing like maybe an Esper midrange, like you said, it carries a Jitae. I think the funniest thing about this card is that it lets a Grixis control deck have a nice little roadblock that can draw them an extra card and they still get to play Madcap Experiment. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's it. Like blue, if, if I were to name two decks, it would be the Grixis deck that gets to do that. And like a blue, black control deck proper. 
that just needs more road bumps. What about like bug mid range? Yeah, bug. <sighs> That's what I was thinking about for this one, right? Like it, it, it plays pretty well with acceleration. It, it, you know, the amount of value you, there's a lot of words on this card. Yeah, I'm going to return this to my hand with a Spring Leaf Avenger or a Fallen Shinobi. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit higher on this card. Yeah. Thank you, Serge. <laughs> I look forward to killing you with this deck at the next Friday Night Paper <laughs> Fight. Here's a card that might kill someone at a Friday Night Paper Fight. It's Controller. James, play the laugh track, please. This is Black Market Tycoon. It's red and a green for a 2-2 cat rogue. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, Black Market Tycoon deals two damage to you for each treasure you control. And it taps to create a treasure token. My Discord went wild when this card got previewed like they lost their mind the idea of creating treasure tokens and it's just two damage is what they said before <laughs> i came down from the mountains with two stone tablets and said like no look how wrong you are this is i, I don't like this card uh, i don't like this card at all yeah yeah i i will say the one home where i actually don't hate it is like a gruel monsters or mid-range deck with more five drops than it probably needs to have. <laughs> but like how many elves do you need to play before you start considering this? Because it has summoning sickness, right? Like this is not great mana acceleration. Right. You play it because it's like a Lotus Cobra in a deck that only really needs that boosty for one turn because a dragon's going to kill your opponent. That's the only home that I could see it where you're like, you play all the one drops and you're on like double like mana crypt soul ring or like double mox mana crypt. And you're just trying to play big idiots in red green. And you know, the best part about Lotus Cobra and paradise Druid is that they attack for two. And then occasionally they will, well, not occasionally they will add some mana. So I think, you know, if you want some redundancy in that line, this is still like a better body than say a Sylvan carry added, you know, this can actually attack, which is pretty important. All right, all right, okay. Overall, I'm still on team. This is more litter box than cat. <laughs> I I think, again, anytime you're evaluating a mana dork, you have to think about where it's accelerating you from. Mm -hmm. And this is letting you skip three. Mm -hmm. Like, going from one to three, which is what a mana elf does, is very important. There's a lot of those really powerful three-drop mana accelerants that gets you from, like, three to five or three to six but i don't know i don't know if two to four is that important it's like the four drops are pretty busted you know and like questing beast is a pretty strong card so like four is very important but at the same time like you are a deck that is making the conscious de decision to play dragons and so you want that big leap that Lotus Cobra can provide or the security that Paradise Druid can provide. So like, that's why to me, again, this is more like, hey, look, Ma, I can hold a GTA well or <laughs> like a skull clamp and trade with something big. But I, I did forget that it's a two, two for two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Body Dropper. This is a two mana, two, two devil warrior. Whenever you sacrifice another creature, put a plus one, plus one counter on body dropper and a black and a red and sack another creature. Body dropper gains menace until end of turn. I think the first Mimi question that people are going to ask themselves is, is this, does this go in aristocrats? I don't love it for that just because the activated ability is quite expensive and typically you're not winning as much by turning creatures sideways. But I do like this card. And I think I like this card more in a deck that's incidentally sacrificing its creatures or has a little bit of, of redundancy or a little bit of grind and attrition that's happening, which black and red naturally does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this screams to me like Rakdos aggro. Yeah. Clap, 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 clap. Where right? you will. <laughs> yeah, yep. Where like <laughs> you'll sacrifice things, but also, you know you kind of just want to play goblin guides and ragavans as well the counters are nice if you have a way like speaking of ragavan or not even ragavan uh carry zev or mm -hmm. there's a couple of cards in rakdos why did my brain keep forgetting that word that gives you like uh three one elementals that you throw away and if you have a way to cr like trundle in with those and then sack it for value after the fact you know get a little bit more incremental advantage 
off of these disposable bodies that you have anyways. That's, I think that's pretty spicy. Lightning skeletal. Yeah, exactly. Even OG ball lightning, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> triple red in this deck might be a little hard to hit, but I like where your head's at. We'll play Blood Moons. It'll even it out. <laughs> Speaking of, here's a three mana enchantment. Broker's Ascendancy. It's green, white, and a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each planeswalker you control. This is theoretically an enchantment that doesn't do anything. Right? <laughs> That's my biggest issue with this. It's, yeah, it, it's just these kind of cards are really good when they get played and do something. <laughs> but they're really bad when you're looking for anything relevant off the top of your deck and you draw this, you know? And it's not the kind of like speed in which other cards like a uh, GTA or a, or a sword can make a creature a threat, right? An immediate threat or something like Kessig Wolf Run for lack of better options. I even, like, let's just compare this to Glorious Anthem. Yeah. You know, a three-man enchantment that comes down and gives your board plus one, plus one immediately. Yeah, sometimes that's what you need, right? Like immediacy and pressure and ease of casting. And it's just like, if I'm playing Bant, do you know how many three drops Bant plays? It's, it's There's just no room. I think that's the biggest issue. Yeah. This, this kind of just falls in the category of there's not enough room, but also it's a card made in 2022. So if it <laughs> hits the board and there's enough going on, you will lose to this, but it is not the correct choice. I'm curious if this gave the counters at the beginning of combat. Oh yeah. That I think that's a bit of a that's that's a changer for sure. Yeah. I think it does enough at that point because it's it's that immediacy, right? It changes that math. Yeah, and that works so much better with like creature lands as well. Right. God, creature lands, yeah. Speaking of the brokers, let's talk about their charm. A broker's charm is a three mana instant for a green, a white, and a blue. Choose one. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. Not even fight, just punch. Destroy target enchantment or draw two cards. I like everything that this one has to offer. I think it offers enough flexibility that you're pretty happy to cast any mode. And I think the best words on this card are or planeswalker. I think that's very, very good. <laughs> I, I always, it's always nice to see a disenchant that, you know, if it's not disenchanting something, which there are more targets than ever, it can just draw you two cards or a thing that'll be recurring comment on any triple uh, pipped card nowadays is this pitch is to endurance, solitude, or a subtlety. Yeah. And force of will. And I mean, force of will. About, yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. And disrupting shoal and force negation. Like it's just <laughs> there are like the strength of some of these multicolored cards, especially the charms, which I think makes them a bu whole bunch better, is that they all actually just have this secret mode of like, and if none of these <laughs> apply, then you, great. It'll pitch to whichever incarnation or elemental uh, you want. So that yeah, I think this one's likely the one of the best of the bunch I, so i was i was gonna i think we can save that discussion after the last charm yeah but you don't want to blow it on the first one <laughs> yeah okay well how about we start adding some more charms to this list cabaretti charm it's a red green and a white for an instant and the three modes are cabaretti charm deals damage equal to the number of creatures you control to target creature or player creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain trample until end of turn and you make two one one green and white citizen tokens. One one minor correction: creature or planeswalker, not creature or player. Oh, excuse me, creature or planeswalker. Yes, this can't go to the dome. If it did, I'd be more excited to talk about this in other decks. But as it stands, I'm mostly just looking forward to either dying to this against Naya tokens, or wiping the sweat off my forehead as a sign of relief because my opponent used this on their turn three. <laughs> like this is a weird one where this will absolutely it has a home i believe it'll see play and that middle mode is terrifying i actually misread that middle mode i thought it was target creature not your entire board oh my god yeah that's instant speed overrun like it doesn't take much to make blockers bad like just in general and this does such a good job of that the problem is the default modes, like 
great. So I need a board to get rid of something, but I'm in white and red. So I already have swords and unholy heat yeah. and bolt and whatnot. I, but like the first, like if that does a thing, congratulations, but you're mostly just playing this as like, Oh, I drew this and can now kill my opponent. Cause they block like a ham sandwich, or I need something to make tokens immediately. And it does that. You know what this reminds me of? Like a better Boros charm. You are going to make some enemies with that. <laughs> Am I though? Cause like Boros charm used to have that finisher mode, right? Mm. You're like, you're you're really hoping to get to somebody, get somebody with the instant speed double strike or like the indestructible is kind of cute, but, you know, yeah. and eventually you just end up cutting it. And I think this has the same end the game out of nowhere potential with more flexibility in the other modes. I, th I think if anything can come out of this card, it's that more people realize they should be playing Naya Charm. Just deal three to a creature, return any card from your graveyard to your hand or tap all creatures they control. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's fair <laughs> it, it kind of just does these but a little bit better you just need to think a bit harder which could be a struggle <laughs> for tokens players um <laughs> Woo! hey all right well, let's move on to crew captain uh for a jund a black a red and a green you get a 4-2 human warrior with haste and crew captain has indestructible as long as it entered the battlefield this turn now on paper this card probably isn't that exciting. You're like 4-2 with haste, maybe indestructible turn it comes into play. I think the strength of this card is the fact that it is both a human and a warrior. And the tribal potential from there means it does just a little bit more. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. It, um, I think yeah. it's a role player. I don't think it's an all-star, but I, I, I think it. in humans or warriors, you could have some fun with this one. I don't think getting punched in the face needs to be elegant, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And like, I, I, if somebody shows up with like the old Jund, like beep, beep, aggro, triple mox deck, this card will kill me. It'll kill a lot of people. And I think that it's, like you said, we'll get more uh, love out of the humans deck though, or the warriors deck. But yeah, it'll kill you. Onto a card that, might kill someone who's to say this is from one of the new Capenna commander decks. It's called cryptic pursuit. It's two blue and a red for an enchantment. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery card from your hand, you manifest the top card of your library. So if people aren't familiar manifest is you just put that card face down and it's a two, two creature like morph. And then you can turn it face up at any time for its mana cost. If it, happens to be a creature and then cryptic pursuit has another line of text that says whenever a face down creature you control dies exile it if it's an instant or sorcery card you may cast that card until the end of your next turn i can't believe i'm saying this but i could see this card showing up in blue moon yeah honestly i yeah it it, it pitches to both force of will and <laughs> uh fury <laughs> which is very relevant those cards are like blue moon nowadays it's one of those i mean maybe this was the case back back in the day as well but certainly for now where you think you're winning because they get down to like two cards in hand and then they're up to six and you're just like oh okay where'd that happen and they go down that low because they are making such like sweeping plays with you know force of will subtleties fury that kind of thing and if they're doing that with a card like Cryptic Pursuit in play, which is, you know, more difficult to kill than, say, like a Poppet Stitcher or whatever, that's pretty gross. And, like, you just, it, it just makes bodies. It's, the only issue is that sometimes it's a little bit picky on when you get the bodies, but I think there's enough value behind this card that I kind of like it more than some of the Planeswalkers I see that deck playing. There's, there's such an interesting density of Spells Matters cards. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> you, you can, you know, obviously young Peasy, our friend, young pyromancer kind of like carries the mantle and he's at the front. And then it's like the, the bad Bob count, right? Yeah. You're like, all right, do I play Talrand? Probably not. Do I play that weird one five that perps out, poops out birds? You're like, oh God, mm -hmm. maybe do I? <laughs> Murmuring mystic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I don't know. I definitely, if you just think of it as the body, this card's maybe fine but the fact that all of those manifest cards are also potentially castable spells mm -hmm. 
is I th <laughs> that's, that's pretty a lot scary, of card advantage, right? right? Like that's yeah. the body that's the body advantage that you try and get out of that deck, and a lot more upside. Yeah, yeah. It's it. This card is potentially terrifying. Yeah, and potentially useless. <laughs> All right, next up we have Disciplined Duelist. This is a three mana, two one human citizen for a green, a white, and a blue, or a bant. It has double strike and it enters the battlefield with a shield counter on it. I, I'm, I'm medium on this card and I really wanna like this card. For a long time, a dominant deck in the format was, we just affectionately called it uh, Kata Blade, which is just bant, Triple Moxin, Stone Forge. You play very aggressive low to ground creatures. You give them a piece of equipment. You you start trundling in, and then you get in the board, get rid of all the lands, and win off of it. And this card is a pretty good role player in there. The double strike is going to let you protect that shield counter a little bit longer as well, which is kind of cool. And if you play the the old Jeremy White classic of overextend your own board, it lives through your own wrath which is kind of interesting in a very spicy play. I don't know if how many of you remember the old Jer line of like two drop, three drop, Wrath of God, your own board, and then just build from there, like force your opponent to overextend. Oxidon Smiter into Wrath of God. Yeah, yeah, right? Now, the issue here is three mana is a very heavily contested slot. So even though this card could be a role player in this deck, I don't know if it edges out anything you know a lot of the other very powerful cards at that cmc or mana value part of me but double strike and gta are bffs so i i think i think you could play this yeah i like it i like it it's it's simple kills people not like endless detour which doesn't kill people just prolongs the game it's a green <laughs> white and a blue it's an instant and it says the owner of target spell non-land permanent or card in a graveyard Puts it on the top or bottom of their library. Uh, I mean, okay. This card does a lot of things. Some of these modes are better than others. Overall, this is annoying. This is the kind of card that I don't think I'll ever... Like, I won't... I don't include this kind of card in my control decks. You know? Because it's just... It's unnecessarily flashy to me. Which, like, I'm not playing control to be fancy. I'm playing control because, you know, I've got this foil Jason the Mind Sculptor. It's not going to cast itself, you know, or like, just like, ah, I'll do. Well, actually, you know what? That's kind of fancy now that I'm saying that out loud. <laughs> I play it. I, I the cantrips, swords to plowshares. What's not the love? But like a three mana spell, like it's flexible enough. I guess if you're going to dedicate one, like three mana spell, like reactive spell to your deck, or maybe two, if it's disallow in this card, that's fine. I'll allow it. But I, it's too expensive for mid range decks, in my opinion. And yeah, not my kind of card, but wow, will it make uh, me irritated in match? Well, the, the tempo player in me is a little bit higher than you are on this. And I just think of it as a modal card. Instead of like, if, if you separated all of those commas and put them as choose one, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happier with that. I don't know. If I separate it into like this very, very flexible thing, I like that it's not a bounce. I like that you have the potential to, <clears throat> to time lapse them if they really want it, or it's just gone forever. It's functionally a counterspell that doesn't put it in the graveyard. And the graveyard is such a huge resource yeah. in our format. Three mana. For a uh, spell, three mana is expensive. I'm, yeah, yeah. I, you're, you're not wrong there. I think Definitely the tempo player there. in you is higher on uh, average CMC than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably also fair. <laughs> Next up, we got Falco Spara, the Pact Weaver. This is a four mana, three, three legendary bird demon for a one, a green, a white, and a blue. It has flying and trample and enters the battlefield with a shield counter. And then you may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast spells from the top of your library by removing a counter from a creature you control in addition to paying its other mana costs. I think I like this. I, you've given me, <laughs> this is lined up in such a way that I have a lot of cards that are, are fine, but not fancy. I think the body you get for the cost is fine. I think the shield counter is also fine. I think the ability to look at the top card of your library at any time is kind of powerful. And the flexibility to maybe cast something is good. Caracas. But, 
<laughs> it's Krakus. It's a form out of three, three, a, like four slots, very highly competitive. And this isn't future sight. Like you don't get to really go off with this, but the ability to catch your opponent off guard with a well-timed counter spell off the top, a removal spell off the top that they're not expecting. Like it's got upsides. I, I, maybe this is the sort of thing that if I were to give it like a letter grade, I'd give this card a C. Which is which which isn't really the way that we approach our set reviews, but that's maybe the, the fairest way that I could evaluate this. Is that the way that you would approach building a Canlander deck then? No. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, I just I just wouldn't play this, is but I I I, I don't want to give people the impression that it's maybe not powerful in the right deck, because it might be. Mm. I mean, I could give that a pr- impression if I, if you want. <laughs> like yeah, this is this is the case of it's a mythic card, so it has a lot of text, and that text is appealing. But also, where am I playing this? Why would I play this over literally any other four drop I can play in those colors? And how prevalent is Caracas? <laughs> yeah, or yeah. Vapor Snag, or Swords to Plowshares. A lot of ways to get around that shield counter, eh? It's just, yeah, to me, this is just win more. And uh, yeah, it's it's a commander. It's the way, the way I see it. Sure. It's a commander. Now for something extremely grimy. <laughs> Fatal Grudge. This is a black and a red. It's a sorcery. And as an additional cost to cast the spell, you sacrifice a non-land permanent. Each opponent chooses a permanent. They control that shares a type with the sacrifice permanent and sacrifices it. Draw a card. So if I'm playing a Rakdos or say a Mardu Pyromancer deck and I pay two and I sacrifice an elemental, a pest token, a monk, I mean, hopefully not, but let's say I do, then my opponent has to sacrifice a real creature and I get to draw <laughs> a card and then I also get a replacement. Hey, go with me on this journey. If you're playing a prison deck, you can sack a land. Not only do you end up stone raining one of their lands, you get to draw a card. No, unfortunately, it's non-land permanent. No, I thought it was just a permanent. Oh, I'm so sad. Surge, it, the fret not. If you sacrifice an artifact, and this could be like a treasure token or a clue token or yeah. whatever, and they're playing an artifact deck... They might have a land they have to Yeah, sacrifice. yeah, yeah. No, you're, mm-hmm. you're right. I'm just sad you can't stone rain them. It draws a card. I, I like this kind of card. It's one of those ones where maybe, like, I wouldn't, you don't need to play it in a Grixis Pyromancer list or, like, a Jund, but, like, if I'm Black Red or even Esper, you know, a deck that is likely to, you know, go as deep as playing, like, Mishra's Bauble and Urza's Bauble to have even more, you know, card types to sacrifice, yeah. I'll play this. All right, next up, we have Fleetfoot Dancer. This is a four mana four for Elf Druid. I'm just going to say for one in Anaya, and hopefully I don't have to spell all those colors out. <laughs> it has <laughs> the following keywords. Trample Lifelink Haste. Just wow. Uh, just the creature types, the mana cost, the body, <laughs> the keywords. You know, we used to cast Lightning Angel in this country. And we used to like it, yeah. Yeah, and now look <laughs> at this. <laughs> I, <laughs> if you're playing these colors, uh, you, you, you're probably going to cast this spell. If you're playing two of these colors, you might even splash to play this card. This is a very, this is a very, very, very good top-end finisher. Imagine this coming down on turn three reliably with an elf or possibly turn two with an elf and a mox yeah like, i'm there <laughs> what, a, what a house yeah four color blood got a lot of love from this set a lot of love uh, or just like hot band i think it's funny because it's a three color set but i feel like the decks that most benefit are going to be the four color decks they have the better mana anyways Gross. yep that's true <laughs> well is that even true nowadays man is so busted nowadays that's fair we need yeah to finish like the horizon cycle for enemies and then just we're done <laughs> just make reprints we're good <laughs> speaking of good actually maybe i don't want to say that it's incandescent aria for one cabaretti mana which is anaya it's a sorcery that deals three damage to each non-token creature so if i'm playing tokens what are some of the scariest cards you can think of is it Goblin Rabble Master, <laughs> Legion Loyalist, or Le- Legion War Boss, a Monastery Mentor. It's just like, I'm trying to find a home for this, and I can't find it. 
I don't particularly want to play something like this in Scape Shift, although that's kind of, you know, it's nice that this pitches to stuff. Why? Yeah, I'm I'm with you too. I mean, look, I've even gone so deep as to try and including Whip Flare in my artifact decks as like, haha, one sided wrath. I got them, <laughs> and it the the problem with those is the amount of times that your opponent is playing a similar strategy and suddenly you have a card that does nothing. Yeah, like you're trying to play you're trying to play a proactive silver bullet. And the problem with silver bullets is not all of your opponents are werewolves. Does that, does that, did that, did that scan, did that land? I think that tracks. Okay. <laughs> that joke was about as good as this card. <laughs> wait, ouch. Hold on. Sorry. Wait, no, <laughs> that was better than this card. There we go. There we go. Next up, we have Jetmir, Nexus of Revels. For one and a Naya or Cabaretti. Did I learn them properly? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. For one and a Cabaretti, you get a legendary cat demon 5-4. And has a lot of text. Text one. Creatures you control get plus one plus O and have vigilance as long as you control three or more creatures. Text two. Creatures you control also get plus one plus O and have trample as long as you control six or more creatures. And then finally, creatures you control also get plus one plus O and have double strike as long as you control nine or more creatures. I, I'm okay with this card. It is legendary, so, you know, Krakus is tough, but four toughness is great. It's a 5-4 for four, which is fine. Like, that's respectable, especially if you accelerate it out. And if you're a tokens deck, this is the sort of, like, immediate impact that you really want to see in an anthem. And this is an anthem that turns sideways. So, like, Naya tokens, go for it. Like, this will this will kill people. Yeah, this this kind of just has... I mean, cat tribal as well. Uh, let's <laughs> let's give credit where credit is due. But uh, yeah, it, it's just like the first line of text says, if you cast one other spell this game, you get that. So like if you play this in decks where, you know, this is usually not a good way of evaluating cards, but if your deck isn't doing this, you've already lost the game. I'm terribly sorry. But it basically just says like, it's a four, like you operate as though that first line of text is always met. And that's pretty good. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I like that. And even outside of tokens, like, I don't know, this card's big enough. If you played the, if you played this in like a Naya mid-range deck or like a four color blood deck, even. I, I don't like it as much in that deck just because it doesn't have any keywords. I think it just gets edged out by all of the other four drops that have haste or trample yeah. or haste and trample and something else. But they don't have vigilance. Is it, is it bad to think of this almost like the hoof of the token deck? No, I think that's, I mean, I think the hoof of the token deck is probably Crater Hoof. Being oh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but fair. I, I get Tough what you're fair. saying. Yeah. I get what you're saying, yeah. Uh, you can just, search. you can just play hoof and token. Yeah, 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 I, like, I mean, right. you could, I would just natural order into hoof if it were me, but <laughs> it's the hoof, it's the backup hoof for sure. All right, here's a mouthful. Lagrella the Magpie for green white blue it's a two three legendary human soldier and i'm going to read the text on the card and then very quickly explain what this actually means oh, thank goodness when lagrella the magpie enters the battlefield exile any number of other target creatures controlled by different players until lagrella leaves the battlefield when an exiled card enters the battlefield under your control this way put two one one counters on it basically this is like one of the cards banisher priest or fairgrounds warden where you can play it, have it, and then have it exile an opponent's creature until this leaves play. But Lagrella also lets you exile your own stuff. So you could pick one of their creatures and one of yours, or just one of their creatures, or just one of your own creatures. And if you exile any of your own creatures, when they come back, they're bigger. And that's why I like this card, because I just read the text of what the card does, and all that is good. <laughs> It, I mean, in like a Bant Blink deck or even like maybe a Bant Spellseeker pod deck. It's weird to call that a pod deck because you don't even play spell, uh, pod anymore. But this can deal with a problem creature on the side of the board, like a really annoying scavenging ooze or a finicky utility creature, while also just potentially cashing in an extra card, draw off your Ice Fang Codal. I haven't looked into the loops with this card, but these cards always have loops involved. So many loops, yeah. yeah. And like, usually you don't 
get to see them that often because the style of like deputy of detention or fiend hunter especially are reserved for like creature combo or death and taxes like more traditional creature combo whereas this one is just good it's easy to cast which is a weird thing to say nowadays but i would rather (laughs) see this mana cost than say like green green and then another one absolutely yeah yeah i think this herd's pretty good good creature type as well next up we have Maestro Charm? Maestro? Maestro, right? Maestro's Charm, yeah. Maestro Charm casts for a Grixis, so a blue, a black, and a red. Choose one instant. Look at the top five cards of your library. Put one of those cards into your hand and the rest into your graveyard, Chef Kiss. Or each opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Or deal five damage to target creature or planeswalker. I think this is a lot of flexibility. I think the fact that this puts the cards into your graveyard instead of on the bottom of your library, is going to make a huge difference here. I I think all these modes are totally fine. Pick a card, fill your graveyard for your Avon Heart Stabber or or something else. Five damage is a lot. That'll absolutely blast most creatures that are a threat. And you know what? You'll probably, if you play a lot of Grixis, one of these days you're going to win a game or like muck combat math enough to be able to live through combat with that second mode and then win on the crackback. So yeah, give it a try. Isn't it wild that this doesn't kill Oko? <laughs> or the Royal Scions? <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. This card does though. I mean, maybe slowly until it turns into an elk. All right, never mind. Maestro's Diabolist. It's a Grixis, so uh, blue, black, and red for a 1-4 Vampire Warrior with Death Touch and Haste. And whenever Maestro's Diabolist attacks, if you don't control a Devil Token, create a tapped and attacking 1-1 red Devil Token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. I like this card a lot. Do you? All right, please go on. Maybe it's just because I'm getting big, like, Savage Knuckle Blade vibes from it. From the, like, now's your chance, Ben. Now's the time to play this card without people judging you. It's new. Get it out of your system. But, like... A Grixis mid-range or a Grixis like modernized control list, you know, where it still plays creatures. This card's annoying. <laughs> like that's a huge butt. That, but that's what I was going to say. Like, I know it's annoying, but it's, is it annoying as a defensive threat? Like, where does this go? Does this hold back the board in a Grixis control deck and then eventually on free turns chip in, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> like, I think this just makes your board frustrating. Like, the Devil Tokens attack shockingly well because you don't want to block it. And if they do, maybe that point of damage kills off a Planeswalker, kills a utility creature, you know, whatever. This card is reasonable at chipping at Planeswalkers, especially ones with higher loyalty, which means that you can use uh, low damage spells in Grixis like Prismari's Command or Colgan's Command to more efficiently kill off, like, lingering Planeswalkers. And... If this just hits the table, attacks once, and then just waits to attack until you need another devil, I'm okay with that. Mm. It's easy to cast. It pitches to four soil. You know, it pitches well. Yeah, I think there's enough good going on for this card that I'm willing to give it a shot. And honestly, it's one of the more exciting cards. One of the more, one of the cards that I'm most excited to try. That's, that's wild to me. Because I look at this and I, I go with me on a journey here. Okay. This or Ophiomancer. Oh. So for people who might not be familiar, Ophiomancer, it's a it's a three mana two two for two and mm-hmm. a black. It's a human shaman. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of each upkeep, if you control no snakes, create a one one death touch snake creature token. I actually had that all from memory. There I'm you go. With myself. Yeah. I looked it up after. I like the body better from Ophiomancer. The tokens for the chip damage have death touch. You get one any turn if you're just kind of throwing them away. I, I don't know. Like my my issue with Ophiomancer is that it's sixty dollars or whatever. <laughs> oh no, it just ties to shock, and I don't think you can afford a defensive card that dies to shock in that deck. You know, it, I think I think they do slightly different. They have slightly different homes, hmm. but like I get what you're saying. This goes beep beep surge. <laughs> <laughs> it does go beep beep. All right, next up we have the Nimble Larcenist. This is a three mana two one bird rogue. For a white, a blue, and a black, it has flying. And when it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand. 
You choose an artifact, instant, or sorcery and exile that card. All the text on this is very good. Mm -hmm. I just don't know many decks that want a three mana two one in constructed. That 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 that's my <laughs> that's my take on this one. If it had flash, maybe, right? Like yeah. the the only deck I can pull that like I have played and would, you know, maybe play again was like an Esper Sandy B deck that I last played five years ago. Interesting. Oh, maybe maybe like to loop or to sort of incidentally pod through or something like that. You just play a bunch of annoying creatures that can also coincidentally loop, but like Yeah. Yeah, this card's it's three mana. Yeah, like I think about I think about three mana birds. You, you know, this d does this edge out uh bird uh, idiot bird? No. Nibble obstructionist, no, right? Like Vendillian clique, no. It doesn't have the surprise. It doesn't have as much of an impact like in in Esper alone, you have seven flash threats that yeah. are like at three that are better. And dare I say mandatory. Like if you're playing Esper, you're playing those. And if you're not playing those in Esper, you built your deck wrong. Yeah, it's yeah. just, I mean, I'm yeah. sorry. I'd like to hear your good reason for why you're not playing Hull Breacher, but you know, <laughs> Polly isn't there. And so, yeah, it's just, even after all that, you got room for this? Uh, I mean, you should save some room for this card, I think. Obnixilis, the Adversary. This is one black and a red for a legendary planeswalker with three starting loyalty, and it also has Casualty X. And so, if you're not familiar, or to refresh, because this is a special version of Casualty, when you, as you cast the spell, you can sacrifice a creature with power X or greater, or in this case with power X, and then when you do, you copy that spell. And so for Ob, when you cast Ob, if you sacrifice, say, a creature with five power, uh, you would create a copy of Ob with starting loyalty five. Capiche? Capiche. <laughs> Capiche. Great. It also has loyalty abilities like most Planeswalkers. <laughs> the plus one is each opponent loses two life unless they discard a card. And if you control a demon or devil, you gain two life. Minus two, you make a 1-1 one, one red devil token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. And minus seven, target player draws seven cards and loses seven life. I think this card's pretty strong. Yeah. <laughs> like... At, at first, I didn't. Mm -hmm. and, but I've also been notoriously bad at evaluating Planeswalkers. And then I realized you get two of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think Planeswalkers, everybody gets real excited, right? It's It makes sense. But like, I, I hate to blame Oko for yet another thing, but I think when they see a three-mana walker with this much text and this potential for high loyalty, people scream Oko. And this card's not Oko. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Shocked, no. I'm sure. But I do <laughs> think this card is closer to like the Royal Scions in that it doesn't, you know, Royal Scions doesn't impact the board in a defensive way it just has a huge starting loyalty and two abilities that are fairly good and an ultimate that you can threaten with some amount of regularity if not dealt with and so ob is kind of in that camp where like these abilities are annoying and dare i say fairly good especially when you have two of them going and i don't think you need to have your second copy have that much loyalty right like aristocrats, a, a home for this card, sacking a token or whatever, getting a one starting loyalty ob. Great. This card will just be annoying and won't ever die unless it's targeted by a shock or whatever. And then God forbid you play this in like Grixis midrange where you sack like a tomb stalker or a rotting regisaur <laughs> <laughs> and you just dome people out. Are you excited for this card? I am. I don't know where I would play it. So one of the one of the things one of the turning points for me on this particular card was in the previous episode we talked about the damage to mana value math and at first I was like ah oh, this isn't great and then I thought about because sorry uh, to finish my thought the the plus one ability is a choice and I hate giving your opponent a choice because they're always going to pick the one that's worst for you so you're like oh man two life I don't even get to reliably take a card out of their hand and then I did the math of Three mana for four damage across two obs if you sack a one drop, that adds up. That's 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 good. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's provided they don't answer it, that they don't invest resources to take it off the board or take pressure off attacking your life total directly. And mm -hmm. then I then I like this a lot more. <laughs> I think people when they evaluate cards and planeswalkers especially, 
they are, they go a bit too far when they think about not, you know, trying to think through the lens of like magical Christmas land or like, no, it's good to think about like what a card does when you are winning or if you are ahead on board, right. Or like at parody, you know, th that's the one I like to use, especially where it's like, if you and your opponent have the exact same board and you play this card, how far ahead are you going to get by having this card? Right, right. And if you're even slightly ahead, which is extremely common in Canlander, the, the format that's just about, you know, punching each other in the jaw for the first couple of turns and then very <laughs> slight incremental advantages, like this card could be the thing that turns around. And then if you're behind, I think there are enough scenarios where behind in Canlander means uh, many different things. Like behind could mean you have a board. You have a board that you could sack to Ob to make, you know, two of them that can help you catch up. Yeah. The more I think about this card, the more excited I get, but still reserved, you know. I'm too old to get heartburn over a three million on Planeswalker or whatever. <laughs> All right. Next up, Obscure Charm. For a white, a blue, and a black, you get an instant modal card. Choose one. Return target multicolored permanent with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Okay. Counter target instant or sorcery. Okay. Or destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less. These are all these are all fine modes. I think I think again with a modal card, you're you're getting potentially enough value, enough flexibility out of this, but I think you really have to be planning to get some good value out of the first mode if you want to play this. I don't think you really care for a three mana, very narrow counter spell or a three mana, pretty narrow creature or planeswalker removal spell to be including this. You really, really need all three to do something. And that makes that's really going to restrict the number of decks that want to play this particular charm. Maybe there's an Esper mid-range deck that we like. I mean, I know there is one, but it's very much just, you know, Merktide Regent. Yeah, <laughs> kind of thing. And, and that's the thing. Like, you're not bringing back your Delve Threats with this, right? It does kill Oko, <laughs> and it does kill Teferi 3. Yeah, and it kills Renin 6 as well. Like, there are some targets that it hits, but... I. I I guess one nice part about this card is that it deals with Spellseeker combo on both levels. Mm. And it's pretty reasonable against like Thoracle combo too. Like just yeah. count a counter spell, <laughs> you know, there, but yeah, I, I kind of want to bring something back. Hey, Serge, I got a question for you. Oh, go on. What's a one mana red spell that I've mentioned three times when discrediting a card that we've reviewed? Uh, the monkey? Or well, shock. actually, that's another good one, but shock. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Just keep that card in mind while I talk about Obscura Interceptor. Uh, one white, blue, and a black for a 3-1 Cephalid Wizard. Nice to see Cephalid's back. With Flash and Lifelink. And when Obscura Interceptor enters the battlefield, it connives. And when it connives in this way, you return up to one target spell to its owner's hand. Uh, so again, for people not familiar with conniving, you draw a card and then discard a card, and you've discarded an online card, you get a 1-1 counter on it. So even when you connive, this dies to shock. So this is a 4-mana card that dies to shock. But when it's not dying to shock, it is pretty annoying. The problem is, where do you want a 4-power lifelinker? <laughs> Against a deck that is all shocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hilarious. The, the best matchup for it is also its worst matchup. Ah. I, I will say this. A Venser Shaper Savant that can kill someone is, is not that, you know, that's kind of nice to think about. Like, I'm sure this card is a lot better than I'm giving it credit for when it works. But it's just, it dot, like... The ideal scenario is this, somebody tries to build to their board, you play this, and then you muck whatever spell they're trying to cast, and then now you get to attack a Planeswalker, decimate their life total, whatever, and then you're happy with your decisions. And maybe that's the world where this Esper midrange sits, like you're an Esper flash list or whatever, but you're more about slamming face. But I cannot shake, like it's 2022. I, we might have to retake that. I said the real year. This dies to shock. <laughs> it dies to shock. God. Next up, we have Oscar. 
Rubbish Reclaimer. This is a five mana three, three legendary human wizard for three, a blue and a black. But this spell costs one less to cast for each different mana value amongst cards in your graveyard. Now that only reduces colorless. You can't get rid of the blue and the black. So you could potentially have a two mana three, three. And whenever you discard a non-land card, you may cast it from your graveyard. This card's kind of cool. Yep. Big fan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what else to say. Like, there's not a ton of insight into it beyond it, it does what, you know, what it says. Do you have a, do you, do you have a home specific for it? Oh yeah. Reanimator. Oh yeah. Mostly, mostly world gorger reanimator style decks because it lets you, when you're world gorger looping, this is a great thing to get out to actually have a way to kill them, which is kind of funny. It's very it's like, I'll play this in like a blue-black control or a blue-black X kind of control deck, like a delve kind of strategy. Because that first line of text is just like, come on, come on. You couldn't just like give this, like, <laughs> it's so, I don't know. Maybe I'm just obsessed with it. It's like, it costs one less to cast. Okay. Uh, I crack a fetch land and yeah, I play now, Serum it, Visions. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, now, yeah, yeah. It's just so easy to achieve. Yeah. I, I like this card. I don't think it needs to be too fancy, but you can get fancy with it. And overall, it's way above rate. So you mentioned uh, blue-black control. Mm -hmm. Is this a mid-range card or is this a combo card? Because I, I think it's much spicier in that world gar that world, world gorger combo that you were mentioning. I don't love it in a control shell because I think it's too vulnerable. Like, I don't think the body is big enough to play a role when you want it. This is bad goif. And if you yeah. want it for its engine ability, it's very vulnerable. Then you probably don't want to sink any of your resources trying to protect it, right? Yeah, I think I play it in more of the control to combo kind of area. Or like when I say blue black, I don't actually think you like you don't have to get super invested into this card. I don't think the fact that you could Caracas it itself to protect it is kind of appealing. Sure. And there are more looting effects like careful study being played in basically every blue deck, you know, that wants to play all these cantrips this, or, you know, Jace Vryn's prodigy thirst for discovery. Yeah. Search for Ascanta or whatever. Okay. Yeah. I think there's enough to justify that second ability. It is, you can't get a lands, which is a bit poo poo where like containment construct technically lets you do that. But a three, three for two is, like, honestly, this providing a roadblock uh, or a speed bump, rather, might just be enough. Because sometimes that's what blue-black needs. The biggest issue with blue-black is that you can't really beat jackal pups. And this beats jackal pup. So a while ago, you just got me thinking here. Nick P., a friend of ours, brought Grixis Aggro. And his rationale was, you know what three very powerful spells are? Like Lightning mm -hmm. Bolt, Thought Seize, and Brainstorm. Or, you know, Goblin Guide, Bob, this like super low to the ground Grixis deck. Mm -hmm. What do you think of a two mana three, three that gives you value out of your graveyard for something like that? I, yeah, I think that's, I think that's where we're looking at. And I think that instead of Goblin Guide, we get Ragavan. Yeah, ra yeah, yeah, of and course. And instead of like needing to play Carnifages, we just play Gurmag Anglers. I think I think that's kind of where the delve deck, where the divide between like a Grixis delve and a Grixis control deck gets split. It's just like I'm not playing counter spells. I'm just thought scouring myself so I can get a Murktide region to kill you on turn four, <laughs> or like Death Shadow stuff, you know? Yeah. All right. I like Oscar more now. Does that make him an Oscar admirer wiener? No, that joke's terrible. Anyways, let's talk about a palette cleanser. Park Heights Pegasus, green and white for a two-one flying trample Pegasus. <laughs> And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, draw a card if you had two or more creatures under the battlefield under your control this turn. I mean, it's a two mana, two power flyer with trample. That's pretty good. And if you have creatures come into play, which green white can do, that's also pretty good. Like just playing, like I up, I play a planes, I use a planeswalker and I play a land war elf. <laughs> like great. I like this card. It's I think it's very straightforward and simple. I look forward to playing it in I mean green white aggro could play it because if you just like play two one drops you're getting something that's kind of neat. But flying and trample on a two power body is 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 good enough for me to try this in like a mid-range deck as well.
I want to like try a, it in, Sanct, in uh, Sanctum Stompy. Yeah, there you go. I, I want to give it Rancor. <laughs> I want to I want to suit it up with a bunch of stuff. It's got two forms of evasion. Mm-hmm. So if you let this bad boy or Pegasus, whatever, if you let it grow, it's really going to get out of hand. Yeah, it's a very nasty bird. Yeah. Next up, we have Raffine, the Scheming Seer. This is a three mana one four legendary Sphinx demon for a white, a blue and a black. It has flying and ward one. And whenever you attack, I like the, the wording there, whenever you attack, target attacking creature connives X, where X is the number of attacking creatures. I, I like this. Mm-hmm. I think this is very interesting, and I think this gets out of hand very quickly, because not only does, does connive let your creatures grow, but it gives you a tremendous amount of card selection, which blue decks love. And... As we've talked a bunch here, blue and black already have a lot of built-in ways to leverage the graveyard as a resource. I think this card is fine by itself uh, if it's your sole threat, and I think if it starts to get some backup, it starts to get really out of hand. Yeah, this is the kind of three drop once I go through all those idiot birds where I'm okay playing <laughs> because it just it's so hard to kill. Yeah, doesn't die to bolt ward one even makes it annoying against Caracas and like. I don't know, you got some tokens from your Monastery Mentor or Sedgemore Witch or whatever. Conniving seems pretty strong. And if you have a bunch of flyers or itself, that's going to rack up damage so fast. Yeah. Yeah, this card's scary. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, we've talked about a a bunch of cards in this color wheel that are all kind of geared towards air superiority and this sort of um, incremental advantage as opposed to you know like the big flashy idiots we've seen in <laughs> in mm-hmm. naya or jund and i think i think raffi here is enough to maybe maybe tip the scales and making it a little bit more of a of a real archetype yeah baby beluga is that what we're calling it <laughs> maybe we could call it baby blue white <laughs> black <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, here's a uh, segue. It's a Rego Streetwise Mentor for hybrid green, white, white, and then hybrid blue, white. So you can play this for triple white or some combination of those. You got a 2 2 legendary cat citizen. And when it comes into play, it comes into play with a shield counter. And whenever you attack a player or planeswalker with one or more creatures with power, one or less, draw a card. So, Surge. Mm hmm. Soul Wardens. <laughs> oh, they got, no! They got no. one power, huh? <laughs> well, I, I thought of this car, uh, card as... I wonder if this is the same trap as uh, Mentor of the Meek. When you're like, oh, I'm going to get so much value out of this. And you're like, oh, no, it didn't quite work. It's. I think it's like that, except it's more accepting that Magic the Gathering will get played. You know? <laughs> like, Mentor of the Meek has... St- a, a bunch of hoops that are relatively easy to jump through in theory, but in practice, you're just like, oh, I paid three mana for a 2-2 that died to shock. Or like, I, so I need to untap and I need to extend more into this board and I need to have mana up. Whereas Rigo's just like, play me and then attack, right? Yeah. Play me and then attack with your Martyr of Sands or your and Esper elf. Sentinel or whatever. An elf. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then you get to draw a card. That's kind of spicy. Do you like it? Yeah. I don't like the flavor, but I like the card. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Riveteer's Charm for a Jund. I think I, I, some of the other terms might catch on. I don't think Riveteer's taking over Jund anytime soon, though. Mm-mm. Or maybe that's just like old man yells at new magic players or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe that comment's going to age really poorly when everyone's like, what's Jund, forehead? Anyways, <laughs> choose one. Target opponent sacks a creature or planeswalker they control the highest mana value among creatures and or planeswalkers they control. Exile the top three cards of your library until your next end step. You may play those cards or exile target player's graveyard. This is okay. It's got, you know, good flexibility as well. Destroy their scariest thing. The timing specifically for the exile here is pretty nice, especially if you do it at your opponent's end step or something like that. Like it gives you... It gives you some time. There's like a fun window where you can play a lot of those cards. And the emergency panic button of graveyard height makes it fine. It's not terribly spicy. But again, if you're looking for a modal card and you're worried about large creatures, if you're if you're really worried about, I think, specifically reanimator, Mm -hmm. this (laughs) this deals with it either proactively or reactively. And uh, it just gives you a bit more gas. But I'm kind of mad on this one. 
Gets rid of Merktide Regent. Gets rid of Merktide Regent, yeah. Let's talk about a very good magic card, shall we? Rocco, Cabaretti Caterer for X and then Naya, red, green, white. Uh, you get a 3-1 Legendary Elf Druid. When Rocco enters the battlefield, if you cast it, you may search your library for a creature card with mana value X or less and put it into play. Then shuffle your library. Okay. <laughs> huh. They made Court of Calling a creature. Interesting. And an elf druid at that. Yeah. So and it's, it's legendary. An, yeah. So you could Caracas it or they could Caracas it. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love it because you play Rocco and then you get to find, oh, I guess those only blink it. How do we get it into our hand? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't go well with like the pod chains or the Kiki chains. I think we have to approach this slightly differently than those like super busted loops that we already know. Yeah. I'm still okay saying that this card is very good and we'll play it in every creature combo deck that can cast it because it's just so easy. Like even if you just play it for zero and find yourself like your dryad arbor in like a hoof list, <laughs> if you're playing like the red white or the, sorry, the red green or the Naya version of hoof, like just play this like that deck. I think the red green hoof should probably just be Naya anyways. The man is too good to not. Wow, this is like the best wood elves ever. <laughs> if you're getting, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Why well, get a three mana one one? <laughs> yeah. You just pay one. Like, what if you played this and then paid one and found Quirion Ranger or Wirewood Symbiote? Oh, I cracked it. Never mind. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Why is it an elf druid? <laughs> All right, uh, next up we have Scheming Fence. This is a two mana, two, three human citizen for a white and a blue. And I previously incorrectly thought this was just a meddling mage. Oh boy, was I ever wrong. As this card enters the battlefield, you may choose a non-land permanent. Activated abilities of the chosen permanent can't be activated. All right, so it's a, it's a, it's a needle. <laughs> but wait, Scheming Fence has all activated abilities of the chosen permanent except for loyalty abilities. What? You may spend mana as though... Yeah, the only thing you can't do... It's just not a Planeswalker. Yeah. What? Yeah, I mean, you can choose it. You can choose the Planeswalker. Yeah, you still you still shut it down on their side. Yeah, it's a 2-3. <laughs> and a human. I, you can't see my face, but I'm just, I'm just shaking my head over and over here. So I a little pet archetype that I love a lot is uh, Blue-White Tempo which kind of like also falls in the world of blue white hate bears and what a, I, i'm sorry revoker i think you've been forever removed from my deck yeah i mean for for what it's worth you can't preemptively name something yes yeah you have to pick a permanent that's already in play which revoker does give you the advantage over yeah so time vault makes us a bit awkward but you know who's playing time vault <laughs> you could play thoracle now but there are other stuff where it could be a little, little awkward, right? Like uh, birthing pod decks or whatnot. He turned this into a pod. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of gross. Yeah, this card's good, Surge. It's pretty good. And it just creates so many weird lines where your opponent can like accidentally amaze. Imagine you're playing against a like a grindstone combo deck, and they and they play it out, and they're like, "Well, I'm gonna kill you on your upkeep," and you activate, <laughs> you like. You sneak this into play and you get to combo them out. Oh God, I th this has so many powerful magic stories just waiting to happen. I like this card a lot. I'm going to play the heck out of this. Yeah, this card's it's a 2-3. Why is it a 2-3? Just play, yeah, this card's annoying. Very annoying. Hey, here's a format staple. It's called Tainted Indulgence. It's blue and a black for an instant. Draw two cards and then discard a card unless there are five or more mana values among cards in your graveyard. Yep. Cool. I'm wow. playing this in every deck that has blue and black. Hey, here's potentially another format staple. Voidrend. Three mana instant uncounterable Vindicate. Well, I guess it's it's not Vindicate because Vindicate can hit lands. But destroy target non-land permanent uncounterable at instant for a white, a blue, and a black. I mean, if you're a in those colors, I think you're just playing this all the time. Contractually obligated to. Yeah, like... <laughs> you just you just play it <laughs> yep please just play it yeah if you're aggressive if you're mid-range if you're control you play it all right those 
those last two were very quick and very clearly. Here's something that takes a little bit longer and is very good. <laughs> Zia Torres Envoy. So this is four mana, uh, one and then Jund for a 5-4 Viashino Warrior. It has Trample. And whenever Zia Torres Envoy deals combat damage to a player, look at the top card of your library. You may play a land from the top of your library or cast a spell with mana value less than or equal to the damage dealt from the top of your library without paying its mana cost. And if you don't, put it into your hand. And then Blitz for two <laughs> black, red, and a green, which, as a reminder, if you pay for the Blitz cost, it has haste. When it dies, you draw a card and you have to sack it at the end of your turn. You know, I almost kind of forgot about this card, and it's very funny because all these big four mana threats that I said, like, oh, maybe four color blood, like that Naya one for sure will still see play. Why would you do anything except for stuff like this? <laughs> like, what the hell? What the hell is this magic card? Maybe they're trying to get people to stop playing Questing Beast. <laughs> and they're like, man, we need to put, we need to make something that's like pretty strong, but in a different way. Yeah, we need to make a card that has the same number of words as Questing Beast, <laughs> but isn't Questing Beast. Maybe they got tired of all the jokes that we made about how long Questing yeah. Beast is. <laughs> and they're just like, all right, here, let's see you try to make a Zia Torres Envoy joke. <laughs> like, it's wild. Every other card with Blitz has room for reminder text, including the Thrag, <laughs> including the thrag Tusk. <laughs> Like that Thrag Tusk with four or three abilities also has room for Blitz. <laughs> this one is like, nope. There you go. Yeah, this card's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I would play it in decks that can cast it. All right. I got uh, two final topics before mm -hmm. we take it home right now. Okay. The first is Charms Ranked. Ooh. Okay. So we've got five charms. We have uh, Brokers, Cabaretti, Maestro. Obscura and Riveteers. And I think we're both on the same... Oh, crap. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me, let me try and organize these here. I, I don't know if I could... Do you, have, do you have an order already? I got an order. All right, you go, you go first. Maestros, Obscura, Cabaretti... Wait, Maestro first? And, and, what? All Maestro, right. Maestro, and I got a reason why that you actually didn't mention. All right, keep going. All right, yeah, do your thing. I won't interrupt. Maestros, Obscura, Cabaretti, Brokers, and then Riveteers. So in English, Grixis, Esper, Naya, Ant, and Jund, or whatever the, the lat, yeah. <laughs> the, the first ability on Maestro's charm is so good. Yeah. It's like the best impulse we've seen. It's yes. forbidden alchemy, but one more card. Yeah, yeah which yeah. is a wild mode. Like that's just one of your options. And so if I'm playing Reanimator, that's pretty strong. Like I think about this card. I think about the Grixis one mostly for Reanimator because it sets up your graveyard while putting the Reanimate in your hand. It also is enough damage to reliably kill Scavenging Goose, Deathrite Shaman, and Lion Sash. And then if you're playing a reanimator deck that has like an infinite loop, like a world gorger one, you can loop this spell repeatedly by returning it to your hand to just drain them and kill them. Hmm. Or you can gain that ever important three life to let you gristle brand more times than previously. What about you? My list is remarkably different from yours. Okay. I have brokers and cabaretti tied for first hmm. between the two abilities. Then I have maestro. Then I have Riveteers, and then finally Obscura last. Okay. And I think, I mean, maybe you talked about Naya Charm probably just being better than Cabaretti Charm, but I look at what they offer to the specific archetypes, and I think the flexibility is just better. But I, I, again, your, your combo implications for Maestro is probably pretty right. Yeah. And then Obscura, I find everything it offers to be very restrictive and very clunky and i just think the, the those particular colors can just do so much better for for less but i guess you know the flexibility of a charm card charm card is the flexibility it offers but wow this is one of the first times we've been had very differing opinions on something like this yeah i think i'm i'm i put a lot of emphasis at least for obscure charm on replacement equity like w it does, it, it really fills what charms should do, in my opinion. Because I do think these kind of cards are overplayed. Are overplayed? 
Yes. Yeah. Because what this does is it has three abilities that are all good, right? They all can do something that is just always going to work. You know, it's weird to say where it's like, well, my counter target instant or sorcery isn't going to work if they play a planeswalker, but it's like they will always do a thing reliably. And what they are doing is going to be like, will always be what you're hoping to get. Do they have a creature that's a creature or cheap planeswalker that I need to get rid of? It will always kill it. There's no huh. scavenging who's big enough. Do they have a madcap I need to counter? Yep. Do I have a thing I need to get back from the graveyard? This one's a little bit rocky, but the ones that you can get back are likely some of the best cards in your deck. You know, even if it's just getting back a Baleful Strix or that Aven Heart Stabber or a Teferi or an Oko, you know? <laughs> Oko in our four color deck now, yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, might as well be, right? If we're splashing for death, right? So yeah, it's just like, I, I think it's kind of weird because Cabaretti Charm feels like it's going to be the most played <laughs> in that deck and yeah. will be the most, you know, it'll do that thing and that'll be scary for that deck. I guess maybe I even, I arrange them in probably the most linear, the most like obvious power level too, mm -hmm. as opposed to I, your deeper analysis here. I want to make one plea to you. Oh, go on, please. I'm not here to tell you Obscure Charm you should be the second best or whatever, because again, that, that we really don't know until we play it. Yeah. But there is one thing I do know, Serge. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're out of your goddamn mind if you think I'm going to cast Riveteer's Charm or anyone else is going to cast Riveteer's Charm profitably. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe that was supposed to be last. Yeah, all right. That's fair. It's, I just look at this card and I, yeah, all right, all right, all right, I'll change laugh. it. Riveteers is last. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. I don't know. I just found, I just found Obscuria so, I think Riveteers Charm knows what it wants to do and that's just not good, but it has a good identity and Obscura Charm just feels all over the place. Yeah. Obscura Charm can definitely be the classic, like, oh, they cast a Planeswalker and it was a four mana Planeswalker and I don't have anything to return to kill it. Yeah, you like it literally blanks three for three on that one, right? Yeah. Like, how do you deal with an Elspeth? So I guess it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of dancing with Broker's Charm, I guess I should say. But like, it's it's just, there's the, the first mode on Obscure Charm has such a high roll potential. Oh, I do have to point out, though, that it's only multicolored permanence. That, oh, that yeah. really restricts how many hits you have, right? True. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not even it's not even like everything in your graveyard is potentially even live, right? Yeah. But it does. Second question. Yeah. Or maybe more of a closing statement. What are your thoughts on this set? Do you like it? Uh I think I said it in the first episode. This set could just be the five tri lands and unplayable <laughs> garbage, and I would have been happy. But instead, we got the five tri lands and then a bunch of neat little role players and uh juice to some archetypes that kind of needed love in exactly this way, you know? Like the cheap blue black cards so that they don't die to jackal pups, uh, a bunch of cards for like a, a green X mid range deck that, you know, like it's weird to say, but like Jund mid range has enough tools to potentially keep up with like a blue deck now, which is kind of neat. And Scape Shift, like, wow, Triumphs for Scape Shift. What about you? I want to, I want to say I'm medium on it, but. Preface it specifically in that it feels like all the cards they've added are for decks I don't play. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Except for maybe Scape Shift. I've been known to I've been known to valicate a person out here, here or there. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's got very cool cards, mm -hmm. but I've never been like a four color blood player. I've never been like a mid range aggressive player, and as that's... such, it, it does. It's not going to be as memorable for me personally. But mm -hmm. I think it is going to be good for the format in that it, it hasn't given us anything super busted. It's just added a bunch of cool cards and cool finishers, specifically I'd, in like three and four drops. I bet you would love four color blood. Like I'm not a four color blood player, but I bet you would love four color blood. I could see you falling in love with four color blood. The problem is it's a linear strategy that wins games of magic. And that's not who I am, Wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can, I mean, you could play so much garbage in that deck, too. <laughs> like, you don't have to play a good deck. If I don't have to jump through at least three hoops to win a game of Magic, am I even playing Magic? That's true. Okay, five-color zoo. <laughs> oh, oh, you have my attention. Huh? There you go. Domain tribal. <laughs> All right. 
dear viewer, that's going to do it for our set review. Thank you very much for listening. Hey, any cards you think we missed, please let us know in the comments down below. We'd appreciate it. A reminder that this podcast is brought to you by you with your support of the Patreon over at patreon.com slash loading ready run. I've been Serge, joined by the wonderful Wheeler, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.